very big Greek folk Greek drama. Not only was it Greek drama day on campus, but our very own students have also been performing the 66th Kings Greek play in ancient Greek, no less, at the Greenwood Theatre. And so a lot has been going on that brings us together around Greek drama. Today we have the very special honor of having Afros Stabilopoulou with us, who will be introduced by His Excellency, the, uh, the Argentine Circus. I have the honor to get some practicalities out of the way. First of all, if the fire alarm goes off, stay put. It happens all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Especially at 9 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Uh, Afra is the author of a recent book called Directions for Directing in English, and we brought flyers along. If you're interested, feel free to pick one up. I also brought some extra copies of our Center for Hellenic Studies newsletter along, which I have the honor of directing. You can find a year's worth of events in the newsletter and know that next year's uh, event calendar will be equally rich. Our lecture share this tonight actually fits into the Cyprus lecture share this, which has a long tradition that my predecessor Roderick Eden and the Cyprus High Commission have productively started. So I wanted to point to the book. I also wanted to point to Avra's play, which is called Phaedra I. And it's it's wonderfully ambiguous because you don't know if it's Phaedra first or Phaedra I, but it's Phaedra I and it will be performed all of next week at the Tristan Bates Theatre. The, the information is online and tickets are available there as well. And then libations come after the event. We have a reception that is down the corridor to your right. So past the main, <coughs> the main steps to your right where during the day uh, coffee is served, but tonight uh, some heavier stuff is served. <laughs> On this beautiful note, let me introduce uh, every piece, every year. This was the High Commissioner of Cyprus and who has had many international hosts, including the US, Canada, Libya, Moscow, the Netherlands, and who's now been in London for many years. He has a special love for the music and the arts, so it's very special for him to be able to have it Thank you. I'm not going to be as eloquent as, uh, as, as the predecessor, but I want, from my behalf, to, to welcome each and every one of you for taking time from your hectic schedule to be here with us. Uh, um, it wasn't two, two or three days ago we had the last one lecture. The last one lecture, and, and it was a great pleasure to attend it, and of course it's always a great pleasure to be here. Uh, the lecture, as has been said, presented today by Dr. Abra Silvio Pulu. It's a very important initiative uh, as it inaugurates collaboration between the Cyprus High Commission and the Open University of Cyprus uh, here at, at the uh, College. At the same time, as it has been said, it is uh, part of the Cyprus Lecture Series, uh, co-organized by our cultural section and the Center for Hellenic Studies uh, here. The Cyprus Lecture Series as King at King's is a tradition that goes back many, many years. And I am especially happy that our new uh, cultural counselor, Marius Psaras, Dr. Marius Psaras, and the new Korais chair, of course, uh, of modern Greek and Byzantine Studies, Professor Konta Van Steen, I pronounce it correctly, yes, absolutely. Uh, are continuing this tradition, and I express my deep appreciation to, to both. <clears throat> this event is therefore the product of a fruitful collaboration between three cultural and academic institutions in Cyprus and the United Kingdom, thus underscoring our sustained focus on cultural exchange and in forging a closer relationship between Cyprus and the United Kingdom. But it's also an event that aspires to bridge the gap between historical and contemporary cultural production. Indeed, how could we, how could we bring ancient Greek drama into dialogue with a contemporary international audience? How could modern technology assist in communicating the diachronic messages of Aeschylus, Sophocles, Aristophanes, and of course, Euripides? And last but not least, what are the limits and limitations of adaptation? I am confident that our lecturer, 
will help illuminate these and other relevant questions, and she's a specialist in theater studies and a director herself. And we have now the book, <laughs> How to Direct Directors. Abra Sindro Gurdu is assistant professor at DNA, uh, at DNA in theater studies program at the Open University of Cyprus, and artistic direct, director of the Athens-based Persona Theater Company. She has written extensively on the theory and practice of directing for the theater, as well as on adaptation, especially of ancient Greek drama. She has been a visiting researcher at MIT, Zari, Leeds, New York, and Tokyo. And she will be a visiting scholar at the Center for Global Shakespeare, Queen Mary University, in London, and the Institute for Theater Studies at Fry University in Berlin. As a director, she has staged performances both independently and with Athens based Persona Theatre Company internationally. Her current directing project, as has been mentioned, uh, is the multimedia production Petra I. And I wasn't sure I or one or anything, but okay. Which premieres on Monday, 18 February, at Tristan Dates uh, Theatre here in London. Not just the 18th, right? You have several. Through to the 23rd. Okay, and you yes. will you will let everybody know. Hence, I am particularly pleased to pass the floor to Dr. Silvio Hulu, and I wish to thank her again for what I'm certain will be a fascinating presentation. Thank you very much, and I extend my thanks and appreciation to you all. Thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, it's a great pleasure and an honor to be back at King's College, my alma mater. Uh, few decades ago. Uh, I would really like to thank His Excellency, the High Commissioner of Cyprus in the UK, Mr. Evribidis Evribiadis, for his support, Professor Gonda Van Steen, Corey's Chair uh, at the Centre for Hellenic Studies at King's College University, and last but not least, the Cultural Councillor of the High Commission of Cyprus in the UK, Mr. Miles Charas, for taking this under um, his wings. Um, I will share with you some of my thoughts about adaptation. I think this is an issue that has been bothering many artists and theatre scholars alike, especially when it comes to the issue of how much freedom do directors actually have to interpret. The ethics of directing is part of my um, ongoing research, and I will get straight to the point, um, starting with uh, a quote by Italo Calvino, a classic is a work which relegates the noise of the present to a background hum, which at the same time the classic cannot exist without. And two quotations from two very well-known directors. Um, I'm faithful to the texts. I invent nothing. <coughs> Our duty as directors is to be good readers. This is from Ariane Nushkin of the Théâtre du Soleil. And Lisle Conte of the New York-based um, Worcester Group claims that adaptation is when you take something familiar, something you know or think you know, subject it to every conceivable transgression of interpretation and form, and return it to you illuminated and deepened. So this talk today has a, a twofold approach. It is based on my research on the ethics of directing, of the classics, as I have just mentioned, um, included in the international volume Adapting Greek Tragedy, New Contexts for Ancient Texts, which I am co-editing for Cambridge University Press. It's forthcoming. Hopefully, it won't be too long now before it comes out. And also draws on some insights gained during the process of staging my own adaptation of the Phaedra Hippolytus myth, entitled Phaedra I. Um, which is uh, opening on Monday at Tristan Bates Theatre. This simultaneous immersion into both academic and artistic work, while clearly a schizophrenic affair, at least has convinced me of one thing. In the whirlwind of 21st century global crisis, cultural, social, moral, identity, you name it, contact with the ultimate archetypes of the human condition embedded in the ancient Greek plays can perhaps safeguard our autonomy of thinking and of feeling. As Nietzsche had long ago claimed, without myth, 
every culture forfeits healthy, creative, natural power. Only a horizon encompassed by myths locks an entire movement of culture into a unity. Greek tragedy's humanistic perspective provides a highly intellectual sort of homecoming, as myths, fundamental and primordial, lend themselves to guilt-free ownership and appropriation. To theater artists, contemporary disenchantment has often been followed by an attitude of irony vis-a-vis -vis tragedy expressed in the desire to interpret the past through a contemporary lens, often communicating the dissonances and paradoxes of a globalized world. Several years deep into the postmodern era, for all its legitimized claims on deconstruction and revisionism, questions about faithfulness and sacrilege continue to generate controversy. New theater genres that have been created through tireless innovation with hybrid forms, including the live digital interface, but also with the audience's immersion into the theatrical event, are now becoming the rule of the day. The relevance of classical works in our ferociously mediatized times keeps resurfacing whenever a new production comes to contemporize what is fundamentally timeless. The literary canon grants us the comfort of re-understanding fundamentals and reconsidering absolutes, perhaps from a distance, a safe distance, thus sparing ourselves instant identification with painful, violent, or atrocious emotions. Moreover, adaptation seems to legitimize directorial choices that would remain mostly unacceptable in mainstream theater, licensing and foregrounding heretical imagery and scenographic metaphors during characterization, daring characterization and unusual casting. Similarly, many directors have tried to frame tragedy's remoteness in a style notably less declamatory and formulaic than the one that had dominated theater for the greatest part of the 20th century. After all, engaging with a tragic form helps us re-understand fundamentals and reconsider absolutes from this distance, even though we're still confronted with the discomfort of identifying with painful and violent emotions, as I've just mentioned. At one point of their career or another, many renowned directors, among the likes of whom Peter Hall, Peter Stein, Tadashi Suzuki, Peter, Sell Peter Sellers, earlier generation directors, Robert Wilson, but also Katie Mitchell, Ivo Van Hove, <coughs> Romeo Castellucci, Anne Bogart, Theodoros Terzopoulos, and several of the younger generation artists whose names would expand this list beyond salvation, have tackled the innate challenges of the genre. Some have accepted tragedy's linguistic, structural, and contextual limitations as a sacrosanct given, employing more conventional modes of staging. Others have tampered with the form with a critical eye and a desire for subversion and provocation, consciously or unconsciously revealing a sense of entitlement over the interpretation of tradition. One might argue that the key to the viewing of myth and by extension of tragedy as a cultural bridge lies in the understanding, acceptance, and use of a contradiction. Greek tragedy is both a cultural product and a universal property. In a global community, it soothes our anguish of unrootedness. By turning politics and religion into dramatic conflict, it forces us to consider our own position in society and also come to terms with our mortality. While the ubiquity of hyphenated forms threatens to undermine or displace emphasis on story and intelligible linguistic codification, myths can function as an anchor of identity encapsulating, quote, underlying inarticulate assumptions about the world and human existence, end quote. So theater directors turn to tragedy, not simply as a thing of the past, an archeological relic, but as something totally projected into the future, something inevitable, in the words of Romeo Castellucci. In their expansive inner space, Greek plays, house the perennial extremities of our condition and address current social and political anxieties. In their daring to put out in the open essential and unresolved issues, they create a forum for easing or set settling mental and psychological unrest. 
more than ever before, that is, we need tragedy to reinstate belief in what is beyond human comprehension or scope to give shape, face, and voice to the dispersal, fragmentation, and lack of closure which haunt any attempt for self-definition. American director Ann Bogart, whose work on Greek tragedy has typically received critical acclaim, thinks of plays as little pockets of memory. She makes special reference to the classics, describing how a director can use a Greek play about hubris as a chance to bring that question into the world and see how it looks at the time you're doing it. Moreover, she understands artists' fascination with revisiting old works to be part of the need to reclaim something that has been lost, the sense that theater has this function of bringing these universal questions through time. Given the powerful resonance of the poetry, quite obviously the impact of ritual endemic in both myth and theater, has made Greek drama viable in all geographical contexts and quite susceptible to multifarious staging experiments with various degrees of success. Revisionist interpretations of Greek tragedy carry within them the paradox of a conflicting desire to remember and to change, to revive and to bury. Ordinarily, spectators appreciate hearing the words of text familiar to them, either through formal education, theater going, or personal study of original versions and derivative adaptations in different media and forms. Yet while audiences may feel at home with the familiar fabula and the quotable quotes, they also wish to be surprised, to be exposed to jarring alternatives, and in this way, perceive myths in a new light. Aware of this paradox, directors are thus confronted with the ancient, fixed, and in a sense, no longer retrievable reality of antiquity, but also carry knowledge and experience of the plastic, to quote Roland Barthes, fragmentary present, which forces upon us different hermeneutic criteria. American playwright Charles Mee, whose inspired adaptations of the Greeks include the Trojan women, a love story, Orestes 2.0, and Big Love, which is a surrealist take on the sapient women, points out that because these old narrative structures are in some fundamental way authoritarian, part of the struggle in the arts is to figure out a way for a person sitting alone in a room to come up with a structure that allows other people to take part in the making of the experience. That performances of Greek tragedy and of classical works in general have become the locus of contention regarding the need for, as well as future viability of straight readings, is a well-known fact. Essentially, the strains that characterize revisionist stagings have a lot to do with critics and spectators opposing sets of expectations of fidelity. On the one hand, a faithfulness to the original work, what I might think of as a conservative attitude, more or less, and on the other, a furtive, unacknowledged desire to be surprised by the product. Evidently, simply retelling the story that Euripides or Sophocles have already given us with no consideration of the factors that can still render it relevant, is no longer a viable artistic endeavor. In many straightforward renderings that claim affinity to the ancient conventions of performance, the vital text falls into deep slumber and eventually fades into oblivion, as if collapsing under the weight of the centuries that it has carried on its shoulders. Much of modern theater's inability to arouse any genuine reactions in today's disillusioned audiences could be partly attributed to the fallacy of recreating, or slavishly aping, the imagined conditions of an era that are no longer applicable or interesting to us. What Patrice Pavis terms archaeological reconstruction has long ceased to be the representational idea of a classical work, ignoring as it does the unique circumstances of the audience at the point of reception, and thus resulting in an echo rather than a distillation of the original story. On the other hand, the term contemporary has also been abused by otherwise well-meaning experimentalists, its alluring connotation sadly bound to the cliches of deconstruction. In describing as historicization a process of interpreting place from the point of view that is ours at the present time, 
with situations, characters, and conflicts shown in their historical relativity, Pavis once again creates a useful typology which draws attention to the dangers involved in the artist's tendency to explain the present too much by forcing the place to say what suited us at the time. That said, rather than being confused with the everyday or the realistic and the vernacular, contemporary could ideally function as a barometer of pertinence, measuring the level of relevance of the original material to situations and attitudes familiar and meaningful today. A classic tells us Cita Calvino is a work which persists as background noise, even when a present that is totally incompatible with it holds sway. No less firmly, George Steiner attributes the classic's integral authority to the quality that allows it to absorb without loss of identity the millennial incursions upon it, the accretions to it, of commentary, of translations, of enacted variations. The question to ask, therefore, would be, does a classic really need protection? And similarly, is it not precisely its openness to the turbulent Tur turbulence of change that has rendered it universal and timeless in the first place. Will ownership of an adaptation equal authorship of a new autonomous artistic product? Is adaptation an objectionable behavior bordering on the limits of distaste? And indeed, sacrilege. How do we deal with the insidious agenda of artistic decorum when discussing adaptation? And more questions. Could directorial intervention function as a legitimate attempt to improve an inadequate play, or in the very least decode its grayer areas as best as possible? How is artistic agency established? Should the director pay the necessary dues to the play's canonical status? And if so, what exactly is it that constitutes canonicity? Who controls the material? Who owns the text? What in the end is text? Now these are only very few of the issues, some quite old, some not so old, springing right from the unsettled and unsettling relationship between directing, adaptation, and authorship. The blessings and handicaps of a mise-en-scene with a manifestly experimental and formalist edge are an integral part of the discussion on adaptation of the Greeks. Increasingly, I think, audiences have grown weary of celebrated avant-garde versions, and I'm going to discuss a few of those, as some of these tend to resort to heavy-handed, provocative, and ultimately hollow and reductionist metaphors. Some critics have, for example, spoken derisively of Pentheus changing into a slinky green cocktail dress upon Dionysus' invitation for him to come out in the 2007 National Theatre of Scotland's production of Euripides' Back High. Many scholars have also commented on the anesthetizing coercion of form and the general tendency to appropriate these ancient texts by inventing a new set of conventions which ultimately classicize them rather than render them fresh. In Herbert Golder's words, the ways we nowadays appropriate the Greeks, we have imposed our contemporary concerns on them and correspondingly oversimplified their complexity, or closeted them in a skeleton of conventions, turning them into a beautiful and bizarre spectacle from another land, over decorated with tapestries from the Orient, woven in exotic patterns we have all now seen too many times before. The Greeks have been deconstructed and postmodernized, stripped of their comprehensive ordering power and their potentially more spacious vision of our own experience. In discussing Klaus Michael Gruber's production of the Bakai, an old production part of the Antiquity Project at the Berlin Schalbina in 1974, Already German scholar Erika Fischer-Lichte described the revised hierarchical structure between text and performance in director's theater, Regie Theater, in terms of Nietzsche's understanding of dismemberment, sparagmos, relating to a process of tearing apart the original text in order for the performance to take shape. Further, she drew attention to the distance of the ancient text, which any staging should bring to the light, and insisted that revivals are actually unable to access the past because it is lost and gone forever. What remains are only fragments, 
playtext torn out of their original context, which cannot convey their original meaning. One of the purposes of staging Greek and other ancient texts is to remind us of this distance and to enable us to find ways of coping with it individually and perhaps to insert parts of such texts into the context of our contemporary reflections, life, and culture. Consequently, in any adaptation of the Greeks, the director, I think, must take into account the interaction of past and present. She cannot ignore current reality anymore, and she should altogether dismiss the play's reception at the time in which it was originally produced. In either case, oblivion may lead to an inquiet rendering lacking a viable inner pulse. At the same time, one of the harshest criticisms that theater artists have incurred decries choices of extreme recontextualization. The critique may not always be warranted, given that adaptation also, adaptations also serve an educational function in making all texts popular to new audiences through approximation and updating, bringing this text closer to the audience's frame of reference in temporal, geographic, or social terms. One such felicitous example is Tadashi Suzuki's work, Japanese author, which not only instills ritual and vestment elements of his native note tradition into the equally heightened form of Greek tragedy, but which also originates in a need to process the social and political transformations of Japanese history, traditions, and identity. Suzuki's acclaim testifies, among other things, to the fact that in order to do justice to the director and the production, one must take into account the special conditions of reception. Interpretations that may seem trivial or even blasphemous to one audience seem markedly appropriate to another, reflecting, as they do, some of its unique cultural circumstances. The question of ethics should then also be addressed in terms of context, which ultimately conditions meaning. Central in director's insistence on form, or on some directors, um, is surely a determination to construct powerful modern equivalents that will correspond to the heightened style of the classical work. We are stunned at Romeo Castellucci's transcendental scenography, Robert Wilson's ever-expanding color palette, Ariane Mnushkin's exotic figures, Katie Mitchell's mediascapes. We are grateful for the beauty and the visual insights they provide for the place. This is when form deepens, magnifies, and amplifies the original work, building worlds that transform the writer's imagination into a moving sensory experience. No doubt such encounters are fueled by a burning desire to understand, to express, to connect. Striking ideas and visual imagination can only work, though, if these originate in the artist's deeper vision of the world. It is this connection that holds the material together and breathes life to it, and that's when adaptation truly becomes meaningful. When such desire is absent, however, extreme stylization can yield cold results. Reliance on the eclectic marrying of different performance traditions may foster emotionally dehydrated art forms, which instead of reveal the aspects of myth and of a place that can either move or invite critical understanding or both, can flatten out the work to the level of a directorial gimmick. On occasion, in their relentless pursuit of imagery and metaphors, certain avant-garde directors may become oblivious to whatever threatens the work's deliberate, if hazy, abstraction, verging on cultural appropriation and or ahistoricity. In such context-free performances, any desire to revive the universal elements of the story seems detached from the discourse of social and political theater. Both Peter Brook and Ariane Nushkin, for example, have been repeatedly critiqued for their mix and match approach to myth, as well as for abusing classical themes and stories, turning them into vehicles suitable, by virtue of their sheer remoteness, for experimenting with genre and style. Locked in the imagistic arrogance of postmodernism, anesthetization seems to be a one-way road, with the audience sitting back comfortably to extract maximum pleasure from an aestheticized, but at the same time fundamentally soporific spectacle. The inability of form to echo content underlies the fundamental criticism of new formalism, 
an increasingly self-absorbed focus upon form and structure in its own right. Repeatedly, the postmodern freedom and tyranny of choice make it difficult for some directors to channel their interpretation into a clear point of view. While visual dramaturgy helps unearth, clarify, or enrich certain aspects of the original text that are obscure to a contemporary audience, visual avidity can oversaturate interpretation. Robert Wilson's work on Euripides' Alcestis, based on Gluck's opera, may help illustrate the point. A paradigm of visual verve, Wilson's study remains predictably an exercise in lush theatrics, which fails to register the grotesque absurdity of the text. Writing for the New York Times, Mel Gasso relates the director's ambition to move beyond Euripides and to transmogrify the play into a performance piece of broader geographic universality, one that encompasses Egyptology as well as the Oriental arts. The critic registers Wilson's extravagant staging, making a vitriolic comparison. When the play reaches a point of sacrifice, it seems to swerve into another landscape. A goat-like figure is eviscerated, and its blood is used to paint the characters. A laser beam shoots from the back of the theater and carves a hole into the mountain. At this moment, one unavoidably thinks not of Mr. Wilson, but of Steven Spielberg, wondering if the Temple of Apollo had not been somehow confused with the, table, the, the Temple of Doom. Problematizing the relationship between our assumed knowledge of the original and its flesh and blood incarnation on stage, what can be seen as a deliberate confusion of scenic signs can often produce a nonchalance that is at odds with the text. Given that the social, civil, and religious import of the Greek plays shelters a strong emotive, affective value, the very texture of drama being intertwined in their cultural specificity, depoliticizing them by means of aesthetic filters sadly divests them of a perspective at once historical and timeless, a reproach that many directors have been systematically charged with. It also diminishes their ability to move. A fixation on perceptual frames obliterates dramaturgical specificity, erases metaphysical viewpoint, and undermines critical thinking. In general, the tendency to demystify is part of a discourse of approximation. See here um, Julie Sanders, who writes a lot about approximation and appropriation of classical texts, which can turn tragic heroes into failed rock stars, feeble politicians, or incapacitated laymen. The peremptory attempt to domesticize the ancient characters in order to modernize them will sometimes hit against the very structure of tragedy, by way of example. British director Deborah Warner's otherwise stunning interpretation of Medea in 2002 conveys the kind of unease that many directors face when confronted with the fundamental unnaturalness of having lofty and often supernatural figures embody human sentiments. This is why the focus is to have spectators quote, identify with weakness, as Fiona Shaw, who performed the modern housewife type of a very normal Medea, argued. In Warner's production, the depiction of Medea as the happy housewife of Corinth seems to invalidate Euripides' portrayal of the character as a female reincarnation of one of the most, quote, most anguished, outsized, titanic, dramatic heroes in the ancient canon, end quote. Warner stages Medea around the pool, which she ultimately uses as a metaphor for a bloodbath. And to some spectators, that image in itself seems to iron out the darkest implications of Euripides' tragedy. In fact, the production's re reception suggested that the directorial outlook, with all its intended psychologization, deprived some members of the audience of that extraordinary impression of alterity that gives the play, Medea, its power. No doubt, the sheer force and energy that epitomize the classical frame may hold or call for a different type of effect. Transporting the action of the tragic place to a modern context is, of course, one of the most popular mechanisms and the most fascinating one of that, of interpreting the classics. In such process of revision, the war plays have been particularly favored. 
Katie Mitchell's 2007 production of Women of Troy projects the image of a ransacked city as transferred to an industrial cityscape near a modern day port site. The set captures an eerie iron prison where the female citizens of Troy, immaculately dressed, are locked in, lamenting their losses while occasionally dancing to familiar tunes or, mo or smoking um, cigarettes. I'm trying to, yes, this is it. Okay. Um, among other things, they also dance the quick step with imaginary partners, staging a ritual of mourning for their dead husbands. And in other productions, the revised context of the myth is not always limited to one single socio-historical dimension. I'm trying to find where I... Yeah, this is from Women of Troy, Katie Mitchell, and this is the Trojan Women. Um, Anne Bogart's 2011 modern dress version at the Brooklyn Academy of Music in New York, reworked by dramaturg Jocelyn Clark, which was interspared with flashes of the Russian Revolution, the Holocaust, and the Balkan Wars, so that the audience can summon any Armageddon at any local, domestic, or international, as a critic pointed out. Bogart insists that the play is as far from a historical artifact as anything that I can imagine. Hecuba, when she looks out upon her wrecked city, is talking about the devastation after Hurricane Katrina or Hurricane Sandy or a recently bombed Palestinian village. As its subtitle clearly indicates, Bogart's and Clark's production is a version after Euripides, where a robust intervention on the source text is taken for granted. These distancing techniques infiltrated into the mise-en-scene are manifest in the strategies of casting against type or in cross-gender and cross-racial casting. They also condition the visual layering, which sometimes bears little relation to the language of the text, to the effect that dialogue, action, and setting stand in opposition to each other. This tension is not necessarily a negative thing. Occasionally, such patterns of defamiliarization force us to look beyond the expected for a meaningful connection between text and subtext. In Polish director Krzysztof Warlikowski's 2009 five-hour-long epic collage, Apollonia, text by Euripides and Aeschylus, Hannah Kroll and Jonathan Littell, provide the narrative structure for an exploration of the theme of sacrifice. On stage, Agamemnon and Clytemnestra, Iphigenia and Alcestis, Admetus and Heracles, Orestes, the perpetrators of the Holocaust, and its victims, most notably a Polish woman named Apollonia, who died in her attempt to save 25 Polish Jews dur during World War II, gather together in a series of brutal rituals of purgation, telling each other ancient and modern day tales in conspicuously post-mythical spaces. In one of the performances most memorable scenes, a family dinner between a despondent Admetus, his beautiful pregnant wife Alcestis, his elderly parents and a doctor and master of ceremonies from the office of Thanatos, disintegrates into a harrowing affair. Alcestis has been rushing on and off the stage in choreographed repetition, trying on different dresses for her husband. Eventually, she slashes her wrists, drawing with her blood a little picture of a small house on the transparent walls of her room. The emotionally fraught image heightening the structural pattern of pointless resistance and ultimate surrender to death. More than any other element of tragedy, the chorus has become the most vulnerable as well as the big star of all sacrificial victims in the name of experimentation and updating. And I'm going to take you to, yes, I think this one. Interesting. Um, stylish and comfortably deconstructive, the work of uh, Joanna Kalaitis, American director, has been subjected to similar bouts of scathing criticism. Her 2009 interpretation of Euripides is the Bacchae, wherein the elemental savagery of the text was altogether eliminated, was according to one critic, and I agree with him because I watched that production, quite akin to a light operetta featuring an energetic soundscape as a constant accompaniment to a hip chorus, embodied by a dozen actresses clad in outfits that suggest Abagon Indonesian. Such production reviews reveal that the emotional impact of the performance was in fact extremely lukewarm. 
Besides trashing the chorus, the critics also attacked the production's toothless outlook during the play's most climactic point. As Pentheus's de uh, tragically deluded mother, the actress Joan McIntosh, speaks of bloodletting revels with the prosaic satisfaction of someone fresh from a cutthroat sail in New York. Indeed, the ancient chorus seems in constant need to defend its awkward position as a defunct convention that must nonetheless be maintained. An uninvited guest, it has also thankfully stretched the limits of directorial interpretation to phenomenal extremes, providing vital metaphors that highlight a more political and socially driven perspective. German theater collective Rimini Protocols 2010, Prometheus in Athens, staged in Athens, turns the whole play into an extended choral part embodying the current cultural makeup of the crisis-driven city, with 103 Athenians representing the capital according to basic official statistic values. Challenging the authority of the Greek plays, a revamped chorus such as the one in Rimini Protocols work, carries the tension of a body that is simultaneously foreign, an archaic convention, and public, representing the humanistic and democratic ideals of community. In this work, Athenian citizens from all over the city, of different age groups, professions, and ethnicities, including illegal immigrants, gather on stage to reenact the Prometheus myth, each identifying with a character from Aeschylus' tragedy, which he or she introduces to us. The chorus members voice their own interpretation of the play's general themes, and most notably so of the conflict between freedom and rebellion against autocratic rule. Parts of the original text are adapted to contemporary circumstance, making the performance a compelling manifesto of communal values in a time of crisis, as well as an open dialogue between performers and audience. Indeed, the spectators are no longer voyeurs, they become public voice. A similar political approach drives Theodorus Terzopoulos' own perspective on the same myth, staged in 2010 in the natural setting of the Eleusina oil mill factory outside of Athens, sparsely refashioned by the arte povera visual artist Yanis Kounelis. A tragedy of a dehumanized man who exists at the threshold of ridicule, this production of Prometheus is an aggressive, almost anarchistic portrayal of contemporary social, political, and ideological turbulence. The emphasis on communal plight is richly supported by current day references interpolated in different moments of the performance. Emotionally loaded phrases drawn from Greece's long history of strife and dissent altogether universalize the scope of the play. Spoken in unison, lines such as, the army is coming, take him away, no, I will not sign, are only some of the hypnotic mottos that add to the generally impassioned effect. The prophetic undertones of there will come a day, mera, their tact will come, taken up in three different languages, Greek, Turkish, and German, are chilling statements of hope and courage, which are, however, instantly annihilated by the negative, it will not come, then thaerthi. After a choral recounting of characteristic modern predicaments, everything burns, forests, factories, books, universities, children, bearing a number of haunting associations, the triple-faced Prometheus, performed by a Greek, a Turk, and a German, delivers an unequal um, political message, after I am dead, the world will change. Otan θα έχω πεθάνει, ο κόσμος θα αλλάξει. Repetition builds obsession, as languages, bodies, and ethnic histories clash and then mesh, until in the end, the intentionally cacophonous klosigalos, klafsigalos, a prolonged sequence where laughter and crying interchange is cut short by the unnerving siren, which takes us straight back to the beginning as the cycle of coercion and defiance repeats itself ad infinitum. Exploiting the emotive dimensions of intercultural collaboration, Teresopoulos turns his production into an obsessive, if loving, choral study in communal pain, a utopian, if necessary, depiction of cultural and most notably of political solidarity. Aeschylus's heightened poetry yields a commanding weapon against oppression as Prometheus's predicament unfolds its ecumenical dimensions. And I insist on Theresopoulos because being a Greek, 
I have to, you know, talk about Greek directors, and he is uh, one of our finest. And recently, I feel that there is an inner movement from the existential and as personal to the political and as communal dimension, which has characterized his work, especially the treatment of the chorus and the Greek tragedy in general. One of the seminal events of the European Capital of Culture Paphos 2017 program, his production of Euripides is Trojan Women, brought the 21st century refugee crisis in startling focus, while also retaining the timeless perspective that is so central in the director's work. Indeed, the sustained human history of conflict and displacement, as Euripides' fourth century anti-war tragedy testifies, has been ongoing, and the need for reconciliation and peace profoundly common across East and West. True to highlighting the drama of division, and the deeply rooted human need for reconciliation, performers from a number of divided cities, such as Nicosia, Mostar, and Jerusalem, but also from Greece and Syria, became the collective voice of human suffering across temporal and geographic borders. Strewn all over a certain confined area of the state, battered military boots, a recurring visual motif in Tresopoulos, signaled the absence of the killed soldiers. Central to this drama was the presence of the Turkish Cypriot Corypheus, personifying the human need to connect with others, despite representing the other as enemy. Gradually, the chorus members would each pick a photograph of a missing soldier from the ground, calling out his name, to which the word missing was uttered with deadly finality in each participating language, Greek, Turkish, Arabic, Hebrew, Croatian, and Bosnian. The linguistic collage synthesized a voice of protest against violence and the absurdity of war. Needless to say, in divided Cyprus, just emerging out of another cycle of failed negotiations on the reunification of the country, the word kaip, Turkish for agnoumenos, or missing person, rang particularly poignant. And we're moving to Britain here in 2015, acclaimed British director Robert Icke, based his celebrated free adaptation of the trilogy the, of the Orestaya at London Almeida Theatre in a contemporary abstract space which merged the stark reality of the present with the nightmarish but all too real memories of past crimes. The action was framed as part of an investigation in which Orestes was questioned by a therapeutic inquisitor piecing together evidence. At the back of the stage sat a huge bathtub in which Agamemnon was murdered, while opaque screens slid to and fro, misting what was behind them and allowing people to glide like ghosts. The adaptation begins with a family dinner around a long table downstage where everyone, including Iphigenia, is present. The backstory of Iphigenia's killing by her father, seen not as a sacrifice but as clinical slaughter, is brought to the foreground against the archaic convention of never representing crime on stage. In its domesticity, as the audience is watching adults put to death a child over several minutes, the sacrifice scene feels excruciatingly violent as the young tiny girl's little legs innocently kick while she drinks her fatal dose. Such revisionist stagings both rewrite and illuminate the original play. In the words of another critic, this is not destruction, but revelation. You can almost feel and see the dust flying off the old master. With respect to his production of the Orestia, director Robert Icke argued that an adapter has to be 100% faithful, not to the letter of the original, but to the impulse that motors the whole thing forward, adding characteristically, Adaptation is like using a foreign plug. You have to find the adapter which will let the electricity of now flow. Without strong metaphors, directorial versions of Greek tragedy can only be reduced to cultural curiosities. For the longest time, many theater makers have played it safe, attempting historical verisimilitude by means of recapitulating the original performance the knowledge of which, I repeat, 
and we all know that, is for the most part sadly hypothetical. In fact, as fischer lichte once again argues, whatever we think we know about the past is a kind of reinvention, a construction, a fantasy. Being the closest other there can possibly be, placed as it is in a kind of public domain, Greek tragedy has become an ideal place for directors to vent off their current social, political, and ide ideological discontent, staging, staging the tragedy's constitutional strangeness in the end can mean confronting elements as alienating as the course and the gods, the heightened language, the stylized movement, and the use of masks. On that account, adaptation theorist in the Hatcham is optimistic. Stories do get retold in different ways in new material and cultural environments. Like genes, they adapt to those new environments by virtue of mutation in their offspring or their adaptations. And the fittest do more than survive. They flourish. Without a doubt, classical works have repeatedly astonished us with their resilience, bouncing back each time after a ferocious directorial attack has been launched. <laughs> And in closing, it is no surprise that the lofty, enduring stature of tragedy with its larger-than-life characters and their representation of forces beyond human comprehension has, in one way or another, become a powerful medium for artists to comment on the absence of grandeur and heroics today. While revised forms can act as a kind of umbilical cord that can nourish the relationship between past and present, the discussion on adaptation remains just as open and accommodating as the classical work itself. And while in any directorial project, it is still useful to distinguish between deconstruction and provocation, the question in the end becomes how intelligent an adaptation ultimately is. How setting, time period, language, character portrayal, and action can be framed in a new light and become attuned to today's rhythms and in the process of generating new artistic and perceptual criteria, adapters will inevitably extend the frontiers of interpretation. The desire to revise, update, and render meaningful can be an indicator of a profound need to preserve, as well as enrich tradition by means of creative ownership. Thankfully, the Greeks are there to remind us that any new reading is ultimately both an opportunity and a gift. Thank you. Because we have one performer on stage who interacts and, in fact, embodies all the different characters uh, of the drama. So she, technology is helping her become Theseus, become Aphrodite, speak for Hippolytus, brings those characters on stage. So um, um, there is a tension there between the live and the mediated that I think um, adds a layer of characterization in the dramaturgy itself. Going back to content, it, um, I wonder what's your take on on how adaptations treat the different relation we have to the divine and the gods. What a problem that is. <laughs> um, uh, I feel sometimes there is this attempt to uh, domesticize even the gods because we can't understand them, because we relate to the divine, if at all, uh, in a very, very different way than Greeks. And so we, uh, I've seen a lot of productions where the gods were just ordinary people moving um, the, around the rest of the characters. Um, and other times, uh, directors opt for absence, so they just give the, the gods the voice and no stage presence at all. So it's a very, uh, it, like the chorus and the, the treatment of the chorus uh, is just another uh, aspect of extreme difficulty when dealing with tragedy. How do you deal with the chorus? How do you deal with the gods? What do you do with them? And sometimes it's easier just for some directors, and I disagree with that, just <laughs> do away with them altogether. Don't even bother, you know, stick to the characters and do the play with just the three main uh, uh, person, yeah, the three main heroes, the three main uh, characters. Uh, but sometimes technology comes in, steps in to give this abstraction that um, the godly, the divine figure needs. And so gods can be 
represented through technology as a, a blurry image of seeing that happen. Um, because it's just so inconceivable uh, to think of God as uh, a real person, and other times the God becomes domestic, and um, in some productions the gods are just yeah, among the rest of the characters. Hard to deal with them. So as an artist, as, as in your adaptation, how, how did you... What, what with Aphrodite. What, what were the something. questions around that, yeah, that, that you faced? Um, I try to keep that sense of awe, of that, um, of metaphysical awe that is there in, in my understanding of tragedy. You know, as human beings, we feel towards anything that is incomprehensible as a divine agency. So I wouldn't represent directly um, a god through a, an actual actor on stage, but I would give it a semblance of presence. And in fact, that's what I'm doing in, in the play. It's just a recorded voice singing coming from somewhere far away. So you're not entirely sure if it is a real human being that speaks or something else. Just the presence to, to create the sense that there is a relationship be, between um, us humans and something else that we can understand. Thank you.